Yeah. My mom, ah, there we go. My mom was nice enough to let me know it was, it's uh, here in Canada, it's a national holiday, I guess, or in BC anyway, it's called Truth and Reconciliation Day. And uh, so that's neat. You know, that's my kind of day. So I'm sure that's a good reminder to us all. That's all I ask. You know, I kind of selfishly as a white person, I take it to like be a blessing to my family. <laughs> you know, I somehow have linked the plight of the native man to our own family shame. I mean, in all honesty, I mean, we are in need. Uh, you know, I came from a family in extraordinary need. You know, dad didn't have enough, mom didn't have enough, even for each other, war enters in to the poverty of the situation and you make some sort of fantastic search to, well, white people do, to ignore it, put it to one side, turn it into other things, life, you know. They become their own people, they leave home. I was watching a TV show where this woman said, oh, he's got out of jail, he's not able to find a job and he's living with his mom. And this idea that you have to leave home and get a job and live outside of your family structure and. I think white people have been doing that a long time, but that doesn't mean it's natural. You can make a dog do a lot of things. You can make a bear, you know, dance on a fucking sphere for the circus of the world. You can kill a thousand bulls, but that doesn't mean it's their nature. You can bind a, a wolf to a sled and uh, a hound to a hunt, but that doesn't mean that, it's, that that's what it's meant to do for the, for the rest of its existence, you know? I think there's something to be said for white people among many other people being a kind of nomadic or small family oriented creature and that forcing families to produce so, so much, so many members of the workforce, do you know, um, when I was growing up, there'd be little classified ads, you know, work at home. It's always useless, right? But how many people, how many children are going to use the internet? to start their own career. Isn't that why they want to make YouTube videos and TikToks? Maybe to make some passive income later on? Maybe make it part of their business? It's not like knowing how to make media, selling yourself is not a good idea for bringing, driving people to whatever it is you offer the world at any time, right? Having Instagram, like everyone expects that now, I've noticed, I don't have, but like having all these, like people expect, if you don't have it on TV, the FBI flag you as like some sort of, you know, lone wolf, you know, antisocial, like, but thankfully I've known people along the way who just don't do it, adults of my age or whatever, who just don't do social media, and apparently it's accepted, <laughs> you know, so far no one said like, what? Yeah. I can't email you because I just don't want to contact people at all, you know, so I don't want people to know my email or anything. I don't, ah, oh, I almost stepped on them again. Jesus Christ. Uh, at least I prevented it this time. It's like, ooh, good for you. Um, it's lucky over there just so like I don't torment the body. So, I like to think that my recordings are somewhat consistent to the realm of truth and reconciliation in North America. Not that that's like a thing I have in my hand and, you know, I know what that is, but there's just the spirit of something that we just have to honor and respect it. You know, I'm glad our country does that for one day. There's no parades, put it that way. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't born here. Yeah. That's interesting. 
I wasn't born here. I was born in England, in a place that hadn't had, you know, we we. I don't know. I'm sure there were people that were there before us. You know, I came from a. If I may say, a couple of fairly world-weary families, slightly beaten, slightly stirred, extremely hard-working. No one in my family has ever been able to go on the dole and stop working. I have a cousin named Randy who also lives with his mother on disability from another section of my family. My mom's older brother who also raped her and her sister. He worked his ass off, I know he did. He worked for my dad between like 18 and 25 and then got on the trains, 25, 30, relationship, house, girlfriend, and then lost everything, got depressed. More likely, life caught up with him. Girlfriend's gone, money's gone, job's gone. You know, he worked and worked and worked. He didn't have a brother, sister to play with. His dad was some fundamentalist fucking evangelical who fucked my mom when she was five years old. You know? Just tends to. He's really great with building airplanes, very meticulous. Very smart man. He built a model airplane, too. One of them is like 12 foot wingspan. It's incredible. But you don't have to think very hard to look back and think, we didn't really have a lot of interaction with my mom. Why were we even there? He had a wife, Betty, who left him, my cousin's mom. Very nice woman. And by all accounts, married a Christian woman, remarried, named Beth, a nice church, churchy kind of female to give him that churchy life, but by all accounts, died a very angry man. But they all worked. You know, you all, you, everyone worked. My mom loved working, my dad. Everyone had to work. No one could not work. And then suddenly, someone can't work. I was the first one in my family, probably in how many generations, who abstained from it. I wanted to go in front of a computer or a typewriter. That's what I wanted to do. I certainly didn't want to leave the home and work off-site. I, I liked about school is I could come home and do my homework. My home was everything to me. I didn't bond with any other place. I didn't think, oh, I want to go to church, or I want to go to work, or I want to go here. Maybe nobody does until they force themselves to, but I didn't want to. Never bonded, never. I knew if I liked Scientology, I knew if I liked reading a book about um, self-defeating behavior, I knew if I liked reading Dianetics, or making a movie, or writing a movie, or writing a poem, or writing some philosophy, or going for a walk, or, you know, learning something about the world around me, which, by the way, for my 20s was never actually about learning about the physical environment, always loving and always knowing it was there, but totally taking it for granted. I probably think about the lake where I grew up several times a week. Just, just pops in my mind. The nature. The nature that will always be there for me. My heart can just go there in an instant and all those trees and all the stars and all the ways that the forest of my heart, in a way, experienced the world for 25 or more years and watched me grow up, walking to the same park, around the same lake, writing poetry, going to work, and that there was a nature around me in the heavens and the earth that knew me. A sun that was never so important that that I could tell my mother that that sun is shining on you today. 
because it's brought you to my door. But also, you are like the sun to me. When you are gone, all that is left to me is the sun and the kingdom of the sun and the birds. And it is inferior to you, my dear mother. You're not the beginning of a mantra. You are the original song of my heart. In everything that has hurt my mother and lied to her and misused her is something that I feel very strongly. It makes me hate. It makes me angry. Even if my body or my heart or my mother or the world managed to protect me from it, which in a way it did, you know, we have other things to do, it makes me angry just to know of it, conceptually. I, I easily rise to anger in the thought of injustice towards human beings. To know intellectually the injustices visited upon my mom, let alone what they've done to me or done to her and done to our lives, which they have. At some point, yeah, it's your Uncle Al, it's this, it's that, it's stories I can tell. He married this person. This is my cousin, whom, by the way, I've never talked to. But I feel for him. And you find that in families with sexual abuse and other kinds of industrial poisoning that no one talks to anybody. <coughs> That's part of the shame of it all. Who wants to sit in a room and not talk about everything that's changed your life? You know, it's like, hmm, you know? Here's to that. I'd rather spend my time that, in some sense, yeah. Nothing compares to the, my mom's influence over my aura at any given time. And I didn't get to see her very much. Whether we just went to the mall or... My mom was always... I tell her that, you know. You're a nice person. You're good for people to be around. <laughs> she just is. She has a very healing energy. Very lucky. She's definitely the white... The white spirit. The true white spirit. The white person. White rape, the white owl. Yeah, that suits her. White owl. What she had worn. What we had worn. What the silent for that it's taken years to, to show my mom that I, how well her suffering was not hidden from me nor from experiencing it and having my own sense of it, but that there's nothing she can tell me about her suffering that I would receive with anything more than empathy and long and many miles so that I could be as empathetic as possible. Absolutely aware, yes, that he was abusing her. Absolutely aware, but waiting for your own words, you know, and feeling in ways I can't describe verbally as my mom is able to verbalize with the help of a nice female author named Betty Peavy that my narcissistic white father took her maternal bonds away and interfered with her maternal nature. Is that not the height of poisoning? Isn't that the height of a disease and a crime and an injustice in the world to my mother and to me and to any of us and to anyone at any time or for all time? And why pa I'm passionate about that. That links my feet to the earth. It grounds me. To kind of know what kind of earth I'm standing on. And that earth supports me and my mother. And that's the truth. That's the truthfulness of life. I trust the earth. I trust the earth like I trust my own mother. 
like my own mother trusted her own instincts or had to, and whatever is befalling us into our blood and into our lives, we have borne it. I will continue to do so with great difficulty. That hurts my heart like you wouldn't believe, and I wouldn't want my mom to see me cry the way I've seen her cry to me about her lack of control of her drinking because her brothers raped her and how she can't control it or do anything about it and she's 70 years old and now she doesn't fucking drink anymore. I just don't want to get angry. I just understand that what's in my heart. I don't ever think I'm qualified to hold that energy. You think a man isn't stirred by that? He is, even me. <laughs> and you would think I'm a pretty lackadaisical person. Or not. Some people would, who probably don't see my YouTube channel. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I'm sorry to be so emotional, but it bothers me so much. <laughs> I'm so happy. I could be with her and guide her a little bit the way anybody would their, their mother through that journey out of that fucking torture that never goes away. It never fucking goes away, man. It never fucking leaves. I consider my uncles horticulturalists of my mother and my emotional DNA. They become the surrogate father of the entire family. The rapist becomes the patriarch. There was a thievery afoot. Rape is a robbery. It's something that people do who would, who would steal, like kleptomaniacs. It's an act of rage. What they did was an act of rage. There was rage in it. They were too young to know how much rage. You know? And you would say, oh, it's lucky that, you know, that they were able to get jobs and have children and live their lives. And you know, it's like, I wouldn't want that to interfere with their life. <laughs> While it interferes with every day of mine. That's not fair. But that's narcissism. Yeah, and it's the it's the the fucking economy of narcissism. It's like it isn't fair, and I'm not a hero, and this is an injustice, and I can feel it, and I'm not special, and I'm not a hero, but I think that something can be accomplished by just having a sense of holding that, talking about it, telling stories about it. That's my medicine. You know, I really connect to frog medicine. Plantain. And you just want to take the poison out. You know? And just let the rest of nature take care of itself. Just help it that little bit. Just that little bit, right? Because plantain's not going to do much, I'll be honest with you. But it's going to like, mm, you know, next to tea tree, it's going to like help push things out. It's going to help the stuff that we have that just pushes things out of us. And it was a, 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 a native person who helped me, me learn that one day while I was acquainting them with my interest in plantain, actually. And say, you know, be very, very respectful of Native people. Like, you can't even imagine. We, I can't imagine. We could, we could never do enough to just be respectful to all Indigenous people in every possible way while just leaving them completely the hell alone. And being lucky for everything we know or hear or get to experience about them or their culture at any time. And uh, don't be surprised if you sense that there's some shock in what people did to them. You know, that this isn't actually for them, this is for us. They've, they are not waiting for us to help them with whatever we did at all. They're not expecting anything. We're like the alcoholic, sociopathic patriarch of the very most sorrowful part of their medicine homes. They're not worshipping our picture. They don't have it framed. And thank you, O oh teacher, the way you teach love through suffering and torture, because that's how your God teaches you about love. Now force that down the throats of, of people. You want to be the one shoving that down the child's throat? Hey, you want to get out your chalkboard and start, you know, mesmerizing them with the spellcraft of your fucking so-called culture? Because the white people don't even have a culture. They just steal other people's cultures, right? Mm. 
you deserve to have one. You know, like anything in nature where there's a deprivation, there's always compensation, and the white people have other things. You know? They must. It is so hard to be white. You will develop a lot of powerful skills. <laughs> I've never met a white person on the West Coast, a man, who doesn't know how to work a skill saw, except for maybe me. <laughs> you know what they say on TV when you come out of the military? Get into trades. Or I think I read it in YouTube. Get out of the military, get into trades, because you get that same male camaraderie. But also, what they're not really saying, what I would say, is there's the same level of shock and battle fatigue. And if you're not in that state of mind, it would be a very inhospitable environment, because it's filled with all kinds of ways of talking that could seem very humiliating. Imagine being in a culture where you meet someone and they, they talk about your penis in the first 30 seconds. I went to a place that had been taken over by a white woman selling uh, micro doses of psilocybin and within a minute of coming in the store she was talking using the word penis and you know this this resort to genital and anal and things even when they're talking sometimes it's like it's um you i think that they're just doing it for effect you know and i just had like it's it's i'm, I'm really so out of touch with my own culture like this is like you sort of think like it's did anyone hear that and you know, for young white people, they seem like good. I, I make a joke about it, like, hey, <laughs> yeah, papi, <and> this, <laughs> of course, uh, that, uh, that uh, would be exactly the right word at that moment. <laughs> a pizzeria. Oh, no, a penis ria. Ria is penis. The religion of the verbalization of genitally specific acts, instruments, and word games, so as to make the environment as purulent as possible in the event of the convenience of our daily commerce. <laughs> our commerce, our congress, our mutual denigration of each other, call it what you will. <laughs> See, that's what it is. It's denigrating. I feel denigrated personally on behalf of everyone. <laughs> that's what happens to my body. I don't get denigrated. Like you, I get denigrated in the name of all people like me. <coughs> you're not just cutting me off on the highway. You're cutting off all men. Women do that, right? You are not just hurting me. You hate women. All of us. Meaning 16 of my friends on Facebook who hate men, but just are really lonely and have lots of cats. <laughs> in all fairness, I mean, women don't need a lot of reason at times to be angry at all men. You ever notice that? It's a problem. It's a parable. It is. Women, even at a young age, white women can fly off into violent rage at any time. And it's like, okay, you know, all right, very good, you know. <laughs> and you're just like, it's like literally like you are in a cat world and they're the cougar and they just like swatch you and get to make you bloody. But it's like, oh, she's so gentle. I'm sure she would never do that again. <laughs> it's almost territorial. It's like, I'm unhappy, I'm going to piss down this road. It's incredible. And the reason I can say that is because it's very physical. It's very physical. It involves the woman's whole body. And so it's like, it goes into like hostility, like, like a cat, like all of its whiskers come up, it's like, right, that. And um, it's porcupine energy too, because it's protecting her innocence. And it's just sending out these quills. She can't help it. It is communicative in every dimension. And the person who's supposed to get it gets it. And you go, oh, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I was on the back of this bus in the Moose, a typically nice but white area. And a young woman gets on, you know, I was like 14, 15, 16, whatever. I'm not paying attention. It's winter. We got to go. And she sits on the back and I'm on the side. And I think I, I got in with her. Maybe she was there already. Anyway, she's. And she, and I, 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 I go to um, open the window because the bus is a bit stuffy and I'm outside. I will sometimes I like to just, especially at the back, because it's the easiest place to open a window without bothering too many people and you can close it very quickly. So as a convenience, just like rolling down your window in a car, rolling. I do that all the time. Right? So I say, you know, um, if you don't mind, it's it's a winter's day, and I said, mind if I open the window just for a minute, just to get some fresh air? And she's like, 
just take off your scarf. Kind of in the tone of voice like, what's wrong with you? You weirdo. <laughs> you ever had a young girl do that to you? It's, uh, I didn't care for it. <laughs> and I can laugh because it's female, right? You're like, okay. But, you know, you know you're, and all these things rush through your mind, like, you know, that you cannot say. And of course, you're not allowed to say. And you wouldn't say, of course. And they're not even thoughts. You know. Later, they will become thoughts. <laughs> but not now. It's not safe. <laughs> it's not safe to think, feel. You take out, you know what? That's a great idea. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not touching that window now. I'm thinking, hmm, maybe I'll just open up anyway. Like, I don't need your permission. <laughs> Take that, bitch. <laughs> but at any point, it's a good example of like hostility, right? Around white people. Anything I did would be hostile at that point, except doing what she said. And, and just pretending like nothing has happened. <laughs> it's hilarious. I don't mean to put it on the girls, right? Clearly she can't control herself. But that's what happens to young white women and white people in general. They're very volatile. Like clearly, this is a kind of very physical, yes, a little excessive, but within the realm of probably her world, this is not excessive. Maybe she does it several times a day. Maybe it's a protective mechanism. <coughs> Maybe I shouldn't have talked to her. Maybe she's the wrong age group. I, you know, I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have opened my mouth. I shouldn't have opened my hairy, misshapen face. <laughs> Maybe that's the answer. You know, and uh, you know, I feel so ashamed of myself accordingly. It's just, it was a little humiliating, you know. And I was happy when she, at some point, she got off the bus, <laughs> and there was no other contact. I think, I think, if if I was a bus driver, this is the shit that would just amuse me to no end. You know, the little abuses that people made out on the bus, because it wouldn't be the first and it wasn't the last. You know. You know, you can remember every one. Remember every weird thing that happened. I don't take the buses anymore. You know, you know, uh, and that po that's the the point I could understand her the most because the bus and these buses are really not a very nice place to be. So whatever I did, uh, you know, I, I added a little bit more of the you know the probably the natural sense of inhibitions that she was already experienced about being there in the first place. And I clearly did not make her world any better place by by talking to her. So I, I get it. You know, it's like the last straw in the camp. Now this weird man is talking to her. And, you know, a, a young person or a stone person or a drug addict or an alcoholic can all have these types of incremental feelings and thoughts emerging from their body in a way that seems way too much about our body for anyone's liking. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> yeah, I don't try to be too much to somebody else's body's liking. I try to be as non-physical as possible. A wraith. Just a head with a stick coming out of the bottom. <laughs> Carried by a potato. Who's learned to make himself useful and cut himself into fries and pour ketchup over himself and offer himself to Matt Damon on the surface of Mars.